So the last talk of this year's NixCon is going to be about building outside of the sandbox. Bye, Leos. Like this one is working? Perfect. OK, so uh, hello, everyone. I have this strange pleasure to be the last one to talk at this conference. But there is a talk that's precisely made for you to think a bit. I have no real message for you, or rather would love to challenge you and think about like, what we do a bit differently. So I am known as Leus. I am currently doing a PhD on build systems. So we can have a chat about that later on. And this is an experiment that comes from, well, uh, some presentation that I made two years ago. So it will go in like very simply with three different examples. I want to build outside of, outside of the Nix sandbox. And I will use different tools to do that, so like CKH, SCKH, ReCC. You will get explanation of that. And then we have a small discussion about, well, what does it mean? Where do we go? And final conclusion. So two years ago, I was here precisely in front of you. And I had this well video. We didn't work at the time, but I think it's fixed now. Like, yeah. <laughs> so um, this video basically shows what happens when you're trying to build a long package like Firefox. For me, it's often Firefox, but possibly you are building GTK or anything like that. And then. You reach the top, nearly all of the compilation is done, and then for some reason, at some point, well, there is a fix up thing that doesn't work, and bam, you are done. You are just back at the start. And if you want to fix the issue, then you have to pay all of the compilation of the full package. Well, so what's the situation now, two years after that? Well, cannot build Nix package incrementally, of course, and that's because of the sandbox. So it means that for Firefox, GTK, LibreOffice, Qt, GCC, well, GCC is a bit specific, all of these things, you have to build them from scratch every time you make a change to derivation. Possibly, that's not something that happens often for you, but if you try to hack in the, to the Nix package, especially if you want to like, refactor the standard environment, something that you should never do, but if you work on that, then you will pay that you have to build everything. So my first attempt to escape the sandbox is um, Ccache. Ccache, I guess everyone knows that. No need to explain. It's quite an old tool, but it's still heavily used in some places. And the basic idea with all of these caches is that, well, you already asked me to compile this file with these options and with these headers, so I already know the answer. I can just fetch it from the cache. A small picture, right? So I just query the, the cache, and the cache says, well, no, no, it's not there yet. OK, so you can compile locally, and then you upload it to the cache for the next iteration, and then you get your result, right? Which means that on the next time, when there is a, a cache hit, you can just recover the result from the cache, and that's it. It should be quite fast. Okay. The funny thing is that I say, well, I want to try that, and then I discover that it already exists. It's already feasible in Nix packages. There is a CKH STDN. That's a standard environment modified that allows you to use CKH. There is a lot of wrapping going on there. You know, we can have a small chat about what, what that means. But basically, if you replace the, the standard environment with that one, you get CKH working. Um, well, you get CKH working, but you still have the sandbox, right? So we'll see how to get out of that. But in Nix OS, that's also already provided. And then it comes with all of the defaults that you need to change into Nix meaning that you need to build by allowing an extra folder, the cache, to be mounted inside the sandbox. And Nixos will do that for you. If you are just using Nix, then you have to use options to do that. Uh, they made it in, a, I have no idea who did that, by the way, I should check. But 
they made it in a very smart way in the sense that you can specify a list of packages that will have this CKH enabled so that you're not breaking the sandbox for everything but only for these very heavy packages that you will compile often. So if in your company you have one big package like that, you can add it to the list. Okay, let's try the demo then. So the, the demo will work, I've taken i3 just because it's a average size C++, C++ project. And we will build that normally and then with CKH to see what it gives. Okay, let's go, yeah. Okay, so if I want to build i3 normally, I just next build this i3 stuff and we will try to get that into, we will try to filter the output. So it's been modified a bit. Um, just checking that everything. So it's been modified a bit because I've added some kind of debugging to it. So you can just see the time that each phase takes. So we get this unpack phase, like, well, that's way below the second, the patch phase, way below the second too. I expect something about 10 seconds to, to build, yeah. So you have eight seconds to, to configure and 10 seconds to build i3. That's with the sandbox, that's everything's normal except of this extra logging edit. Now, if we start with an other tool, we can next build a, I3 CKH. Um, yeah, CKH. Um, if I do it like that, then the sandbox is still active, so it won't change anything, right? So you need to add an option. That's an extra sandbox path. With that, I can build and mount the, the CKH cage inside the sandbox. Well, I don't want to do that at the moment because, well, this cage, we will try to clean it before. Okay, so just to be sure that there is nothing in there on the first try. Okay, we can start compiling it. And of course, I'm still missing that. Well, I'm not sure if you have an idea of what's to be expected, but in this case, we are, there is nothing in the cache. So we need to compile everything. So we'll have to take the same time. And also we have to pay an extra overhead for serializing and inserting everything into the folder. So this should be a bit slower actually. So now it's 10 seconds and 15, so it matches uh, what we had before. Like we are from A to 10 and from 10 to 15, just because we pay the overhead of initializing everything. So if we want to start with an, we need to compile it again, right? So I made a special trick for you that you can just say again to the package and, well, I can't explain you how it works, but it's nothing very magic. The, the nice part is that, well, it starts the exact same compilation with some random stuff added to the derivation, so that's Nick's things that it needs to be done again. And this time it's supposed to be faster. Modulo demo effects. Well, Okay, that's not exactly what I used to have, but it makes some sense. So, um, what's not, what's, uh, okay, right. So we have all of these. Um, if you don't mind, I will take the old results that I had. They're basically the same, seven and six, right? That's what we had, seven and six. So it's like, <laughs> the rounded numbers are the same. So, well, nothing unexpected here. 
except that, well, you see that there is this uh, six seconds that's below the previous build times, and in a sense, i3 is not a tool that uses heavy GCC compilations. There are a lot of manual generation, documentation, generating a lot of random stuff that are not cached by C cache. So of course on a bigger project that uses more C compiling, you would have a better speed up here. But possibly you will also have a higher penalty on the first time that you use it. Makes sense. Well, is this a good thing? Uh, yeah, the problem is that when you try start to make holes in the sandbox like that, well, you know, you you don't have any, any guarantee of what's happening, right? A small hole in the sandbox and that's over. But at the same time, and we'll have a discussion at the end, and I think it can be a good thing, at least in some well-defined situations. Anyway, let's go to the second attempt. So, like, I wanted to use, well, CK is just good, but no, well, no people, they do better things than that. What if I want to use the same cache as my colleague or someone else? We should put that on the network. And that's basically the idea of SC cache, which is C cache shared, or shared C cache developed by Mozilla. Well, so it's Mozilla, so they made it for C and C++, and then they also added Rust because, well, it's Mozilla. And if you look at the diagram, it doesn't change much. It's just like, basically, it's exactly the same. The only change is, um, the name of the, the cache, it's not a folder, now it's a network machine. Which means that you are not mounting a folder inside the sandbox, you, make, you are making a completely different type of hole in there, you need network access. Well, is that possible? No. <laughs> no, it's not possible, it's not supported, you cannot make a small hole and say, okay, I want this machine, I want this port on that server, it doesn't work. So at the moment and for the experiments, what I do is just disable the sandbox. So we're <laughs> entering strange countries, but uh, technically it should be feasible to have like a restricted network access in the sandbox if you want to keep some of the properties, but not all of them. Um, yeah, I also discovered that the sandbox is not like disabling the sandbox is not possible when you are building in different store than your main store. So all of these demos are just changing my main Nix stores. Possibly it breaks things, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, okay. Disclosure here. I, I won't do it because, well, for reasons that we don't have much time, and also because it's not that different. Just disable the sandbox, configure the remote, and that's it. So I will go directly to the third attempt, which is RCC. And RCC, we keep the same ID, except that we had remote execution. That's a tool that has been developed at Bloomberg. And they do it mainly because, well, they love Bazel, they would like to have all these remote execution and things, but, but they can't move at the moment. Like migrating all of your builds to Bazel, that's a huge investment. So they don't want to do that. And they developed this very small replacement that's Instead of changing all of the build system, you just wrap each GCC invocation with it. And then at that moment, everything is sent to the server. Well, you get, uh, the, um, you get the better explanation with diagram. But what we do in this case is that we remove the local compilation and everything is remote. The main advantage is that you can parallelize a lot more. If you have like 100 workers, and a huge workload, then you can spread the workload on 100 workers. That's the main advantage of not executing the, the compilation locally, of course. Okay, so this is the example that may not work perfectly. Uh, I discovered that you need, of course, a server that allows this remote execution. So in this case, it's build grid. I could have used another one, but I discovered different issues. Not sure if it's Nix related or like my VM related or something, but I cannot work in parallel. So I can only compile one thing at a time because the server won't take many attempts at the same time, which is like a bit stupid. It's not a limitation of the tool. It's used perfectly well in a lot of companies, so it's most probably an issue with my setup, but anyway. So it's single-threaded and then the worker is quite slow. So if I had to do the demo for you, 
Uh, well, that's the time it takes. It takes about three to four minutes to compile now. <laughs> well, the, there is definitely some issues somewhere. Um, nevertheless, I think this is mostly like, well, bad configuration from my part. But I really want to show you what kind of strange things you can discover when you do that. So let's start again. So if we. This is completely stupid. Like, it's a build grid server, but it's called build farm. Well, we have to live with that. So um, now on this server, everything is already compiled. So we will remove what's in there. I remove the content that I store that's on the server. I remove the database. So there is just basically a clean server anyway. And I start the server. I also need to start a worker, of course. Yeah, that's initialization. And then because I'm lazy, I did not specify any kind of Docker worker or any environment. I just like use every whatever is on this machine. Well, that's it. And now, can we make this smaller? OK, right. So what we want to do now is build exactly the same thing as we did before. Um, yes. So um, it's Nix. Builds. Okay, we want this uh, i3 RCC. I will take the RCC small, well, whatever. This one should be built already. Let's try. Option sandbox false. This is what allows you to access the network. Um, yeah, it's already built. That's good. And the next is already, is already built, I guess. Yep. So we need to go over and over again. Yeah, OK, that's working. <laughs> um, very useful when you have to build a lot of things like that. And, well, no, I won't say you. Let's see what we get. It fails. It fails and that's normal. That's what you get on the first attempt. If you're like, there is nothing on this remote host. You need all of the build inputs. All of the dependencies of your derivation needs to be there in a way. And this is of course not automated. It doesn't work at the moment. But then I think there is some potential to make integration and to make Nix catch the network access and wrap it, wrap, wrap it in some way. Or we, we should be able to find a way to, to make this work. At the moment, what we have to do is like upload the inputs. So, oh crap. So I just try to collect all of the build inputs of my derivation, and then I send that to the server. Well, this is a trick. There is always a trick. Like the network is not that good that I can upload everything, but I just removed one of the missing files, and this is the one that has just been updated. So if we start again and build this again, again, again thing, what do you expect? Does it work now? Well, can we wait? It doesn't work. The tool is still missing. How is that possible? We've just added the tool that was missing. And in this case, it's like one of the most frustrating parts of this is that, well, the failure is already in the cache. So we're just fetching that. He says, previous time, it failed, so I can fail again. If you want to work around that, then you need to kill everything. In this case, I have no idea how to remove, uh, remove one entry, so just let's be efficient. OK, everything started clean from scratch, so now I can build it. And well, of course, it takes like three minutes, so we won't wait for the end of that. But this time, it should work. Let's wait. By the way, this uh, VCC-small is configured in a way that it 
that the, the cache VCC is not used in the configure phase because the configure phase just drops a lot of the outputs, and so you don't see the error that we had before. Just that's the reason for the dash small. In the, so it's working. It's compiling one thing at a time. Well, it will compile for three minutes. I don't really need it because I have everything in there. So let's drop that. Okay. Okay, it makes sense. So, like, like you've discovered, like we need to have all the build inputs on the server. Like, it's not, it does not exist at the moment. But the fact that it failed is also a good thing. It shows that if you are missing the exact compiler that's required by that derivation, on the worker it will say, "I don't have it." He's not trying to use another thing. He's not trying to use GCC that's installed on that machine. So Nix, by design, with all of these strange paths and ashes, <laughs> makes it so that you do not pick random stuff. We've discovered that like these impure errors are cached. The fact that there was something missing in the state of the worker, like this is part of, this is there forever. That's really annoying. So, well. That's something to, to care about. But I think we could really automate that. And well, the gain is potentially really huge because in Nix, if we can have the real exact set of inputs, we could share this information through everyone. That would be like an Hydra cache for very small C file builds. Well, now there is a question of like, well, this is not pure, right? Oh, we've broken everything, the balloon has exploded, the sandbox is no more. Uh, what remains of the all, good, all the good properties that we had with that sandbox? And so like, well, is it still reproducible? Is it still pure? Is it still hermetic? And all of these nice words that we are used to and that we absolutely want in our builds. And for that, I have a small answer that's based on Nick's experimental. Uh, what I call Nix experimental is uh, like it's an experimental branch from Elko, where you can transform a derivation um, into ah, that's difficult to say. Well, the problem with most of our derivations is that we have plenty of them that look the same. They contain basically they have the same content, but because they come from a different .drv, they are stored in a different store path. And then that store path is inside the binaries, is inside a lot of places. And then if you compare, the bits are different. But we can do something that's funny. So let's find i3. So this is the one that we built before. So it's there. If you go to Nix. Of course, it's a local checkout of Nix and, and another one because I had to build a different branch. Okay, let's hope that it works correctly. Yeah, you have a lot of outputs in this case. Possibly if I reduce the size, that's still readable for everyone. Well, in this case, you have a lot of random stuff. Uh, let's just cheat a bit. There is a mismatch between the daemon and the nix that's running, and well, they don't agree on what we are trying to do. But you see here that this is the path that we received, and this is what it looks like when it's been content addressable. So basically, all the closure has been rewritten, and the name of the path has been changed so that it matches the actual content of the path. That's the meaning of content addressable. Of course, you, there is a problem because paths, they reference themselves and you need to compute the hash on something and you would never end. So basically you just remove self-references, compute the hash and then reinsert them. And so it's not perfect content addressed store. It's like content addressed modulo this self-reference. What's interesting in there is that if everything is working correctly, this i3 C cache, thing that I built, it's still cached, okay? It has a different hash, but if I make it content addressable, yeah, 
if I make it cantaloupe, <laughs> then you see that you get the, the exact same hash here. And this means, and we can check that, but it doesn't make any sense because it's the exact same store location. But if you try to diff these two things, you will see that there is no difference. Well, that's, that's obvious, but <laughs> you, you can try if you want. <laughs> and um, of course, the, the one that uh, remains to be tested is this RCC. Yeah, uh, small or whatever. And that one should also give us the same uh, output. Yes, that's working. Well, in this case, you may not be believe me. You may not believe me because it was already in the cache before. But uh, trust me, you don't want to wait five minutes just for that, for that to build. So that's kind of part and answer. We have broken everything. There is no sandbox at all, and we still manage to get the exact same output. Right. So this sandbox is not like it's not totally needed. It. It's there to guard you against making mistakes. It avoids typical issues. It avoids the network if something is trying and you don't want it to try. But if you configure everything properly, then it should build the same outside of the sandbox or inside the sandbox. And uh, in this case, uh, like you have different derivation, you have different contents before, and then well, like this is the image that was there if there was some issue with the, with the demo, but I guess you got the idea. So um, what we have now, it's a bit like before, but um, well, you know, you compile Firefox, it takes a lot of time, you see that it's making progress, you've got done most of the rest, and then C++ is over, and you, 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 well, you will enter the fix-up phase. <laughs> and then, oh, <laughs> it doesn't work. But, but then you are not back from scratch, right? You, know, you, <laughs> you can recover some of the work that has already been done. <laughs> so that's better. Yeah. So uh, just a few messages. Well, th this presentation is not about like sending messages. It's more like challenging. So I would like to get feedback. If it gives you ID, that's perfect. But like the main message is that you can bridge a sandbox. And it does not mean that you are doing something wrong, but well, that you should know what you are doing mostly. Uh, it's really nice when I see that. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's going to work. We will get these incremental builds inside Nix packages. And that's something that I really want. Uh, I think it will also be really useful to get fast CI answers. So if you want to make a pull request to Nix packages, then you could get the answer within like a few minutes and not a few hours. And also, like it also means that we can trust other tools. Like RCC is doing its best to make it like reproducible, hermetic, and all of these nice properties. Ccache is doing its best, but it's very old, so it doesn't know everything. And then these tools, they are just C compiler abstractions. But they behave exactly the same as like, RCC behaves ex exactly as Bazel, for example. So it's just that RCC manages only one C compile, but Bazel manages a set of files. From the outside, meaning from the Nix point of view, it's exactly the same. It's a tool that's trying to execute something remotely and get the results. So if we go that way, we could consider trusting Bazel, for example, for doing things purely and correctly, and allow it to have access to a cache and a remote execution engine somewhere. So that's it for me. I have questions for you if you don't have anyway, so <laughs> think about that. Uh, what about uh, verifying some compiler cache instruments for uh, reproducibility so that they can be really trusted and not just relying on a limited amount of experiments? Well, I guess that's always the same thing with reproducibility that you have to test it. And every time it's reproducible, that's good. But it's not a proof that it will never be reproducible. So mm -hmm. we can do that with these tools too. We can just start to include them and then compile, compile a few times and then once in a while just make a perfectly hermetic sandbox build from scratch and see if we are still building the same thing. And that would give us more confidence that the tool is working correctly. 
Uh, I mean, maybe the problem is that when these tools had been designed, there was no thought about such thing as reproducibility and uh, it might depend on different things like uh, system clock, for example. Well, truth is I, I'm not aware of all the little deta details of details of all of these tools, so that's something that we have to explore. It's like, look, it's feasible. Mm -hmm. Does someone want to work with me on that? So, uh, one idea came to my mind uh, when you showed uh, mounting the file inside. Mm -hmm. uh, did you try to mount like Unix socket, maybe, I don't know, uh, Ccache and Ccache very well, but maybe you can try networking that way? I tried, and then I had no more time. So, I think that theoretically it could work, but uh, I don't know enough about all the technology details. It from the outside, it looks trivial, and then when you try to set up everything with the like s namespace and stuff, well, it breaks easily. So that's something we can try tomorrow. If you think that it can be do done in a few hours, then I would really like to try. Cheers. Hey, uh, first I wanted to say I really appreciate because I've been many times in the situation where I wanted to package something large like Ceph, for example, where also iterating on bugs. Building Ceph takes one hour. I had to build it over 80 times, so you can imagine that took a while. Um, so I really appreciate any effort in going in that direction. Same thing with Haskell, which when you work on GHC, for example, or iterate on a low-level library and rebuild Nix packages can also take a very long time. So I think this is really good. Um, I wanted to also point out um, another approach that is like a little bit orthogonal to what you've presented that we just discussed yesterday here at the table with like uh, I think EDEF, Pi and uh, me, so NH2, um, which was that you can also do the type of caching that um, uh, Ccache, for example, does specifically for like C things, right, um, on the syscall level. So uh, we could, if we wanted to, p trace the entire build and then see that if, let's say, an exec VE produces certain output, we can cache that and then uh, wrap. Um, any uh, exec VE call that happens again to produce exactly the same output again. So uh, that is, of course, somewhat in the further future, but that might be something that can be very generic uh, across multiple things. I think practically, I will first go with exactly this approach because uh, you have now shown that it works and it's great, and I just need to see how uh, one can how one can get the same thing for GHC Haskell, for example. Um, but in the long term, that might be something that if we uh, agree on enough, uh, bringing enough hackiness into this thing as a kind of like quick developer thing, we might do as well. Well, it's not really a question, but I have still two answers for you. Um, <laughs> Well, it's funny because I had the, the exact same discussion with NBP like last year and the, the year before. Like, well, we could do that on the Cisco level. That would be fun. Uh, through this, it's not that easy. You have a lot of cache entries and etc. So you need to be really, really efficient. So it's like, it's a cool ID, but I'm not sure it will turn out practice. But I'm always available to talk about that ID. <laughs> Thank you. Oh.